Everybody, we're going to be talking about the wrath of God, the seven-year tribulation period, the millennium. What happens to those who get uh, the opportunity to come and survive at the second coming of Jesus Christ? What becomes of them? Well, stay tuned. We're going to find out. Real Life presents the Jack Hibbs Podcast with intention and boldness to proclaim truth, equip the saints, and impact our culture. Today, if this podcast lifts you up and encourages you to live a more fulfilled life in Christ, then make sure you leave us one of those five-star ratings. To us, that's like saying amen or yes. Then that rating will encourage others to listen. Now open your hearts to what God's Word has to say to you. Here is Jack Hibbs. Hey, everybody, welcome back to our podcast, the Jack Hibbs Podcast, and we are here at Real Life and uh, excited to have you guys. Remember, if you like what's going on, make sure that you uh, hit the subscribe button, tell people. Best thing that you can do is let people know that we're here, and uh, we've been going through a really now, which uh, that has become a protracted podcast series on end time events, which is very cool and extremely appropriate. Uh, to the things that are taking place around us. I first of all want to uh, jump in uh, to the fact that, um, and, and we're trying to do this with some chronological context to it, but um, I find it absolutely awesome and remarkable that, that this week, so I, I need to kind of make a time time stamp on this. This is the first week of uh, the month of May, and um, we have heard from uh, Yuval Harari, uh, Yuval Harari. Who's Yuval Harari? He is the um, spokesperson. He's the mouthpiece. He translates into some form of coherency whatever Klaus Schwab says at the World Economic Forum. Um, Harari's just announced that um, AI uh, will most likely be able to generate a religious text that will probably become a um, a a cult or occult type of uh, group that could spawn a new AI religion. And I thought, how appropriate is that in regard in regards to the mark of the beast, the false prophet? Here it comes. And the image of the beast, to the book of Revelation thirteen says, will be granted the power. Uh, to both speak and to really discern who's got the mark of the beast and who doesn't, and those who don't get killed. Uh, That's AI. If you read about it, go ahead and read about it later. Revelation 13, uh, around verse 13, start reading there, and you're going to read about AI in the Bible. An image, it's not human, but it, it appears to breathe, it appears to speak, it appears to discern who's got the mark of the beast or not, it's able to determine who lives and who dies. AI, thrilling, right? Amazing. Breaking news, AI creating religion, which does not surprise us now because we've already seen in the last few months, AI writing symphonies, AI writing poems, AI writing movie scripts, AI writing songs. And by the way, it does these things in about five to seven seconds. Pretty amazing. So um, here's here's where we pick it up, you guys. And I know this is kind of um, uh, just quick, but uh, we left off with the uh, the study of the tribulation period, why it has to be seven years, why it has to be focused on Israel, why the church cannot be involved. By the way, important. All those who are involved in the seven-year tribulation period, don't miss this. All of them who believe are awarded uh, white robes. All of them. All of them. That's important because the church is not given white robes. Tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, and... um, those that are outside of the church age, you and I, they're outside of the church age, they get white robes. For example, King David's going to get a white robe. Noah's going to get a white robe. Uh, those who die for their faith for Jesus in the tribulation, they get a white robe. The church does not get white robes. The church gets fine linen, clean and bright. Very, very different. 
That's a wedding gown, by the way. Very important. The church is not in the seven-year tribulation period. Some of you have asked about the midpoint, the mid-trib. That is honestly one of the lamest um, views because it's kind of like a cowardly view. I mean, I have more respect for post-tribbers than I do for mid-tribbers because mid-tribbers will say, or because they've had to change it, now they call themselves mid-tribbers pre-wrath, because they're so confused about their Bible interpretation. Why are they confused? Because only the premillennial, pre-tribulational, futurist view of biblical interpretation stays true to all other interpretation of doctrine. All the other views, ah, millennial, post-millennial, you've got to change your eschatology. you got to massage things, and it gets all convoluted, and it's difficult. Listen, if you want to stay true to a literal interpretation of the Scripture, then you're, you're going to want to be a premillennial, pre-tribulationist. Why? Because you find out that the church wears fine linen, clean and bright, and you find out that the old and tribulation saints wear robes. But you also find out this, that there will be those who, by the preaching of the 144,000 male Jews— 12,000 from each tribe, so they speak Hebrew and no doubt any other language on earth. They're going to be preaching the gospel, and the Bible tells us that there'll be a multitude so massive that comes out of the tribulation period because of their preaching, so huge that John said that you can't even count them all. It's impossible for them to be counted, and many of them will have to die for their faith in Jesus uh, but I want to uh, make clear that not all of them will die for their faith in Jesus. A remnant will survive. In fact, we know that the 144,000 appear to make it to the end. That is, the end being the second coming of Christ. There's a remnant of believers that are saved. This is very important to some of you who have asked questions. Is If people die for their faith during the trib, and they do, who lives into the millennium? When Christ returns, who repopulates the earth? That's a great question. And the Bible answers that question. Matthew chapter 25, read it later. There in the second coming is Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is talking about his second coming, dealing with the world, unbelieving world, and with the remnant of Israel who believes. Jesus will sit upon the throne of David, which he's not sitting on now. Jesus has never sat upon the throne of David. He has to come back. So some of you have also asked, gosh, I'm going to I'm going to answer two questions in one answer. Those who live into the millennial kingdom, they're mortals. They're like you and I are now, but then you and I will be glorified. They will live into the kingdom. Why? What's the point? What's the deal? Remember this one word to help you. Politics. What's the deal with the second coming of Christ? Politics. Ever since the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel, the Bible has shown us a world that is given over to politics, always looking for a leader. And Nimrod was the first type of Antichrist. And the world has followed types of Antichrist ever since. You can go throughout human history, and uh, the world is looking for a leader. The world has taken government. Listen. Government is from God, invented by God in the Bible. Read, read about government, government in the book of Exodus. Man takes government, takes God out of it, and that void is filled with man. So man becomes God in leadership, not called government, but politics. Politics is man pimping the power of God and the office of government and stealing it and taking it into his own control and thereby ruling over people. That's called politics. And Jesus will have the time that's called the millennium, a thousand years to where he must sit on the throne of David as promised in the Old Testament. He has to. Look, you guys, if Jesus does not sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years, then you and I got the wrong Jesus. We got to start looking for somebody else, but you don't have to, praise God. He is the one, and uh, he's going to sit on the throne of David. That's why he's called the son of David. 
And as I mentioned before, if you remember, David himself, during the millennium, David will be the prince of Jerusalem. How cool is that? Jesus is the king of the world. He is the king of Jerusalem. He's the king of Israel. But Ezekiel tells us that his prince is none other than David, which is very, very exciting. Very few people will take the time to look at that. You can check it out. Start reading Ezekiel chapter 40 on out. But let's let's do this. So those who survive, uh, if you want to know what is going to happen, read Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 follows Matthew 24 in chronological order. Jesus sits on the throne of David, and he gathers the nations together together. Daniel chapter 12, and he sits on his throne. The Ancient of Days is seated, and he judges the nations of the earth, uh, and he separates them like, like, that's symbolic talk, like, like the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus uh, in the form of a dove. A dove did not land on Jesus. The Holy Spirit did at his baptism. Like. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ will separate the nations like a shepherd separates sheep from the goats, okay? And when Jesus sits on the throne, those, listen carefully, those who he separates, those who treated Israel, treated the Jews kindly in the seven-year tribulation period, those will live into the kingdom of God, into the millennium. They will be mortals who survive the tribulation period by the skin of their teeth, mind you. But they make it in, and Jesus so uh, Jesus turns to them and says, Enter the joy of the Lord that's been prepared for you. They start to repopulate this earth, and they're going to do a great job, and it's going to uh, be amazing. Jesus is going to radically restore and uh, perform a great restoration project on the world's environment. The Bible says that when a man dies in that age, if he dies at the age of 100, people are going to mourn like a child has died. So that means longevity is going to increase like it was in the days of um, of Adam. Think about that. And then also this, that, um, that there'll be people born— uh, Jesus will be on his throne. You and I will be in the bride of Christ. We will be ruling and reigning with Christ. It will be granted to not only us, but it appears to the servants of God um, that, um, uh, have, were, that were resurrected uh, to come into that, er, that period of time where we rule and reign with a rod of iron, the Bible says. That means that we will be with the Lord enforcing righteousness upon this earth. That's what the rod is for, by the way. Rule and reign with a rod. Um, that is righteousness being, um, what's the word, endorsed and maintained. You know how everybody wants peace and safety now and people want safe streets? Heaven's going to be a place, oh, sorry, the millennium's going to be a place of safe streets. It's going to be a beautiful environment. There'll be people being born, people who are who will die, but that does not include you and I. It's very important you understand that. There will be people um, who, when, when they come into this m millennial age, I find it fascinating that Jesus put it this way. He said, um, I, was, I was naked and, and you didn't uh, clothe me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Um, I was in prison and you didn't visit me. When you read the context of that, first of all, should you and I be doing that? Of course we should. But Jesus specifically lays it down in Matthew 25 as being something that the Gentile world does regarding his brethren, the Jew. Their conduct in not only belief in Christ, which brings them to that moment, but their treatment of the Jew is something whereby he awards them to live into the kingdom age, the thousand years. So that's a great, great question that somebody asked, and that is the answer where um, mortals will enter into the millennial kingdom. Uh, the millennial kingdom is going to be spectacular, and, and I'm, be I'm being reminded of it right now uh, just because for the last six months in California, for example, it's been incredibly, ridiculously 
especially beautiful. Uh, California is gorgeous, but it's right now it's just in its prime. Incredible rainfall, snow-capped mountains, beautiful days, puffy white clouds, blue skies, green hills, flowers blooming everywhere. I mean, I had a flower blooming in my in my driveway. Can you believe that? It's can you imagine when Jesus is in control? how the earth will be blessed. We're seeing a little sample of it right here in California. Uh, imagine the earth being revitalized by Christ during that thousand years. It's going to be amazing. And again, the book of Isaiah talks a lot about that. I want to leave off with that real quick with the, with the little bit of time that we have remaining. Um, for those of you who are jogging right now, for those of you who are uh, sh shopping and you have your, your earbuds and you can't see, you can check it out later or driving. Watch out, please. I'm, I'm, I'm showing this. This is what I'm showing. A piece of paper here. Um, and you can see, hopefully you can see this. Guys, can they see this? Tell me if this is okay. So the tribulation period is the time known as God's wrath. Okay? And you want to read about this because see this line going vertically and this line going horizontally? A lot of people, a lot of you guys have been confused about 2 Thessalonians 2. You need to slow down and read it slowly. You thought by reading 2 Thessalonians 2 that you were talking about the rapture not happening until after the tribulation. That's not what it says. 2 Thessalonians was written because the believers in Thessalonica thought they had missed the rapture because persecution broke out against them. So they thought, what's going on? Paul said, calm down, you guys. That's why he writes in the second letter, to calm them down. So read 2 Thessalonians 2 and watch this. And if you have to close your eyes, do it, not while you're driving or running. Just listen. The Bible says, and by the way, I did this on a sermon just a week ago. The Bible mentions days. There's the day of God. There's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the day of Christ. There's the day of the Lord. Uh, there's the day of the Lord Almighty. And you want to read those in context. Let the scriptures around that description of the day. What day is it? Well, let the context tell you. Okay? Context will tell you everything. So watch this. Right now, you and I are living... During the day of, let's just say it's the day of the church. I'm making this up right now. So forgive me in advance. Some of you, just forgive me. I'm making this up right now. For argumentation's sake, we're living during the day of the church. And we're ministering, serving, and waiting for something to happen. What are we wanting to happen? What are we looking for? What does the scripture command us to be looking for? The day of Christ. The day of Christ, or the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the day of Jesus Christ. It's all the same thing. And when that happens, watch this. When the day of Christ happens, watch. You guys sure that everybody can see this? The church saints, you and I, go up on the day of Christ. The day of Christ is when he takes the church up. See that big plus sign right there? The intersect of the two lines? The moment the trumpet blows, the, the day of Christ happens and the church goes up. So think of the ref, the ref, I think he's called the starter or the referee. At a track meet, he fires the starter's gun, so to speak. At the shooting of the gun, the church goes up, but then the runners take off on the track, right? Boom. Or trumpet blast, church goes up, the day of Christ, in that instant, the day of the Lord begins. We don't know exactly what happens seconds after the day of Christ takes place when the church goes up, but we know this, the day of the Lord begins. And will it manifest itself abruptly? Will it be hours, weeks? Will it be months? Will it be a year? Or I don't know. doesn't say. But the day of the Lord goes all the way during the tribulation period where the tribulation saints are being uh, saved. They come to Christ. Most of them die for their faith. Not all, but most. Many are beheaded, but not all. And the day of the Lord goes all the way out to the end of the tribulation period. That's seven years. 
And it goes all the way, according to the Bible, out through the millennium. That's 1,000 years. The day of the Lord is when Christ sits on his throne. The day of the Lord is when God's wrath is poured out during the seven-year tribulation period. God's wrath is the day of the Lord. And um, gosh, I don't know how much time we have. We have one minute, a couple seconds. I'm going to give you guys this really quick. You want to know about the day of the Lord and how to how uh, what you're going to miss, believer? And if you're not a believer, um, you can you can put a helmet on if you want. Put a mouthpiece in. You can put your flame retardant suit on. It's not going to work. Malachi four verse five talks about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Joel 1, verse 15, talks about, listen to this, the day of the Lord is at hand, it's destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah 13, verse 6, the day of the Lord is at hand, a day of destruction, again, from the hand of the Almighty. Amos 5, 18, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness, not light. Obadiah 1, 15, the day of the Lord will come upon all nations, it is near. Wow. Joel chapter 2 verses 27 to 31 says that the day of the Lord comes. It's the Lord coming to deliver Israel, my people, uh, Israel, my city, Jerusalem. Uh, it will happen in Mount Zion. He says in the second coming or the day of the Lord, I will then pour out my spirit upon my people Israel. They shall dream dreams and prophesy. You know that verse from the day of Pentecost, don't you? Well, it's gonna, it wasn't fully fulfilled in the day of Pentecost. It will be fully, fu fully fulfilled uh, when Christ comes back in the second coming. We're out of time. This is ridiculous. Um, listen. Oh, yeah, questions. I, I don't know why we have to keep these things so short. Doesn't Joe Rogan go for hours? Yeah, well, no, I can't do whatever I want. I have to go. Um, ah, question. What happens to kids in the rapture? They go up. I'm some, some Calvinist. I got in an argument one time. I mean, I didn't. A Calvinist got in an argument with me because he said, you should say some kids go up. And I just thought, what a, what a nut. Kids are not responsible uh, for their sins because they don't have a proper understanding of the law. You got to be knowledgeable of the law before you can willfully break the law of God, even though by nature they have already broken the law of God because they're born little cute little diaper pooping baby bottle sucking sweeties. They're so cute, but they're little wretched sinners, but they're not held accountable for that. So when the rapture takes place, the kids are going to go up. Kids are going to go up. You say, well, what's the cutoff date? Nobody knows that. It depends on the kids' understanding. 14, 13, 12, 15, 16, 18. It depends on the kids. Listen, I know some kids that are 20 that have mental uh, issues that they're, they're like a three-year-old. So you don't need to get into that stuff. I am pre-trib, and a good friend is mid or post-trib. She always quotes 1 Corinthians 51 to 53 as the reason because it states at the last trumpet. Then in Revelation 11, I believe it speaks about the rapture events again after the last trumpet. Can someone explain this to me? Listen, I actually gave a sermon last Sunday on this very topic. There's tons of trumpets in the Bible. Uh, tons of trumpets from Exodus all the way through to the book of Revelation. Context, context, people, context. Don't confuse the last trumpet with the trumpet that calls the church up, meaning the last trumpet as being, oh, there's the seven trumpet judgments. There's the seven trumpet judgments. There's also the two trumpets that God gave Moses to gather his people together. Listen, uh, John said, I heard a trumpet talking to me. Uh, trumpets are throughout the Bible. Let the context interpret the word. And so when the trumpet blasts, 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 18, that's, listen, Bible interpreting Bible. What's the answer to 1 Corinthians, 5, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53? It's John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3, and it's 1 Corinthians 4, 13 through 18, okay? No worries about that. There is no rapture in Revelation 11 regarding the church. Know the context. 
Uh, so, hey, Pastor, what's up? No flesh survives. Everyone who doesn't take the mark gets beheaded. No, a lot of people do, but not all. Uh, what's the millennial reign for? Jesus is politics. Jesus is government. He'll establish and show the world proper government, which we've never had because Adam and Eve dropped the ball in the garden. And we've been under Satan's uh, politics ever since. Um, only the, uh, uh, regarding the 144,000, um, are they protected? Yeah, the Bible says that they're sealed with the seal of God. Imagine that. They're like super action fig figures. Um, and all the stuff that's going on, they're protected from the plagues, the attacks, the wrath that's swarming around them, devastating people, the, the violence of the Antichrist, the false prophet. They're protected. It's very awesome. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. So I, I, I'm asking this question, uh, what happens at the end of the millennial reign uh, before eternity the thousand year reign is again to establish the true and proper government once that's complete at the end of the thousand years the bible says satan is released but for a moment to deceive those on earth uh imagine jesus will be on earth and there'll still be people rejecting him wow that's absolutely crazy the final judgment will take place the resurrected dead the, the damned or the condemned will stand before the great white throne judgment revelation chapter 20 starting right around verse 9 on it gives you an understanding of what becomes of them the false prophet the antichrist and listen to this when the millennium is done when the millennial period of christ reigns over then the day of god begins and that's when this earth be careful how you read the bible this earth is destroyed but it's not annihilated. This earth is destroyed. The heavens are destroyed, but not annihilated. It says create, that God creates a new heaven and a new earth. 
it doesn't mean he destroys this one. He, he judges it, scours it with fire. And that's why when you read in the Bible that uh, this, you know, this earth will be forever or forever, you read the forever statement. Don't, don't, listen, God's going to redeem this dirt, which is amazing. He's not going to annihilate it and, and create something out of nothing again. He's the redeemer. He's going to redeem it perfectly. So listen, we'd love for you to have you guys hit the subscribe button and stay up to date. We've got all kinds of things that are coming out always. We're just trying to be as busy as possible for Jesus here. Um, and so you can uh, hit the like button. That helps us with the, with the tech moguls who think we're a bunch of nuts. If you like us, it means something to them, even though they don't believe a word we're saying. Please share what we're doing here. And like we like to say, it's time to live out what you believe in. It's time for real life. That's what we're all about. God bless you guys. You can find out more at jackhibbs.com. Take care. This Jack Hibbs podcast, as well as all the broadcast outreach opportunities, are listener supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to jackhibbs.com to learn more and stay connected. Thank you.